This is Flasky Goodness, or why Django sucks, but not really. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Kenneth Wrights, and I work for a company called Heroku. Uh, we're a really great application development and deployment platform, so if you'd like to talk to me about that later, um, feel free to tap me on the shoulder, and I'll talk about it. Um, if you know what I, uh, my name or like what I do, it basically it's probably because of the open source software that I write. Um, I've written a couple different things. Uh, one of my um, favorite projects is called Python Guide. It's available at python-guide.org. And what it is is basically the Hitchhiker's Guide to Python. Uh, the goal of the project is to document all of our best practices in the community. Um, basically, there's all this tribal knowledge that usually is built up uh, that you have to spend months and months trying to assimilate when you learn a new language. Like, you know, you have to use PEP8, and uh, we use PIP and not easy install, and these things aren't written down. Uh, so the goal of this project is to write all of those things down and make it easy for newcomers, um, as well as a, re a reference guide for seasoned veterans. So if you spent 10 years doing Python uh, in the scientific community and you want to move over to web development and you have no idea what to do, the goal of this project is to make it so you can just go and it'll like, tell you what to do. Um, and of course, it teaches you to never panic and always carry a towel. Um, another project of mine is called Requests, which is HTTP for humans. And it is basically, it's really hard to do HTTP requests in Python with the built-in uh, tools. So I built something to make it a lot easier. And uh, yeah, I, there's that. Uh, I also wrote HTTP bin, which is a project that allows you to, basically when I was writing requests, it was really hard to test uh, the client to kind of figure out what the behavior of the client was. Um, you'll notice with things like curl and urllib2 and httplib, all these things will send like different accept headers and different content lengths uh, and content types by default. And to debug these things, I wrote this tool, which basically you just send it requests and it gives you, it's like a mirror, it just shows you what it was sent to it. And it can also give you a couple different responses, like you can say, I want a 500, and you can see what your client will do, things like that. Um, yeah, this is pretty useful. And a couple other projects. Uh, anyway, if you want to learn more, you can go to my GitHub page, and they're all over there. And from doing all this, oh man, I'm missing a font, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, from doing this, basically, I've learned kind of this way I want to try to live my life, and it's to try to open source everything as much as possible. And I've found that that really gives me a lot of benefits. Uh, I've gone so far as to actually open source my genome, which is available on GitHub. It's a, github.com slash kennethwrites slash genome. And it's, it's actually only like a subset of it, the, the 23andMe dump. It's like 20 megabytes. But it's pretty fun because like people have sent pull requests uh, <laughs> to like improve my uh, metabolism for caffeine and things like that. And reduce my risk of cancer. It's, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> but I apologize for this horrible slide. It's supposed to say constraints foster creativity. Uh, <laughs> And this is a bad constraint, I guess. Uh, <laughs> so basically, uh, if you're trying to build things for open source, like if you, I try to basically, if I'm going to build a project internal or external, I try to pretend that it's an open source project. Uh, and what that does is it really like, it gives me this constraint of, uh, it gives me loose coupling for the different components that I'm building. Uh, it gives me a separation of concerns, better architecture, and uh, things like that. You know, my, what in the world? You know what? Give me one second. I know what happened. It's playing my version from iCloud, which was in development, not my final version. I'm sorry about this. Anybody have any questions so far? <laughs> Let's see here. Talks. All right, that's much better. And it'll have my proper slide this time. Yay. All right, cool. I also work, do work with the Python Software Foundation. All right, this is much better. Cool. All right, so uh, back to the things for open source that are beneficial. Um, basically, if you try to treat your projects like they're open source, uh, a lot of best practices start to emerge, which are really great. So like, if you're going to build... Something like a good example is write the docs, right? It's like this open source, um, or it's, yeah, write the docs, read the docs, read the docs. Um, 
it's this really great uh, platform for reading documentation and hosting it. But, um, you know, so it's an open source project, though. So it's mainly a hosted version. Like, you can't really run your own very easily. But, like, there's no database credentials in the GitHub repo, uh, which a lot of people do internally. So if you pretend a project's going to be open source, um, all these things that you would do that are bad ideas won't happen, basically. And uh, if you do decide to open source your code, you can do, that, do so at any time. So all these things about open source that we love, uh, making all these reusable small components that are distributed, they're all about abstraction. And uh, we're going to try to build something today um, that is built on those abstractions. And uh, someone want to give a good idea for like a great startup idea that we want to build? Come on. Weblog, is that what you said? Bitcoin. All right, we'll do, a, we'll do uh, Instagram bitcoins. What? Bitcoin for dogs, that's good, very nice. <laughs> so we're going to build this platform, and we're going to develop it in Django, because Django is awesome, and everyone uses Django for everything, because it's Python, and everyone loves Python. So we decided to pick Django. Uh, there's a couple different benefits that we get from using a system like this. It makes, uh, Django makes a lot of modular decisions for you. If you want to have a lot of small components that comprise your application, you don't have to figure out a way to make those work and how to orchestrate them. Uh, there's an exact specific way to make an app that you know, include into your application. Um, it makes the security decisions for you. So like by default, you'll be, uh, you know, basically Django goes out of its way to protect its users from shooting themselves in the foot. So you know, it'll protect you from like cross-scripting attacks and a lot of different vulnerabilities that normally happen if you were to build it yourself. Uh, there's really great documentation available. Uh, that's one of the reasons the project was so popular. Uh, there's thousands and thousands of uh, resources available online and great documentation. There's books written uh, in a very welcoming community. And a lot of the functionality that you'll have to build for this uh, Bitcoin for dogs app or whatever it is, uh, you might not have to build at all because you can just use a third-party thing that someone's already built. Like if you want to send newsletters out to your users, there's probably something already built that does that. It can save you a lot of time. Um, so yeah, Django's awesome. It also handles things for you. So if you use Django and you start to build your application with it, you automatically get uh, an admin interface and a management interface, uh, like command line tools to create new users and things like that. Uh, you get database schemas and migrations, user profiles and authentication, user sessions and cookies. These are all problems that you don't have to solve for yourself, which is awesome. And, and they also support internationalization. internationalization. Like, like that's, that's again, again a problem that would be pretty hard to solve on your own. And there's a very set path to do that with Django, which is great. So you've chosen Django. Anything is possible. We can go and do anything. We can build our ultimate app and get billions of dollars in funding. So here is an overview of what the typical Django application looks like. Uh, there's basically three different um, components. You have tools and utilities, a web process, and a worker process. Tools and utilities is uh, management tools and supporting services, basically. Like, you have all that command line stuff that you can do. Uh, like, if you're using a tool like Sentry, it will collect all of your uh, exceptions for you and send them to you. These are all, like, you know, utilities that are external to the application. You have your worker processes, which is usually what you send all, like, the hard work to be done that you don't want the user to be waiting for. Like, say you want to... Uh, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, defer, those are deferred tasks and scheduled tasks. Usually you use something like Celery for that. And then you have the web process, which includes quite a few things. Uh, oh, man. You have a uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, user interface. Uh, you know, it's like the entire HTTP layer that, or HTML layer that the users usually interact with is all included in the web process. You have your API service normally and your data persistence layer for connecting to the database, and your CRUD admin, again, is included in this, and your authentication system. All these things are kind of shoved into this web process that does everything, um, which can be pretty good. Uh, basically, you know, if you have all these things in a single code base, in a single process that's running, uh, you have all the benefits of the Django stack. Uh, if you want to figure out architecture as you go, like you're not actually sure what the product or the tool that you're going to build is going to look like, you can e very easily rip parts out and move them around and refactor, and it's just really built for iterative development. Um, you have shared modules to keep things dry, so you can just have like a single Python module in your project that everything imports from. You don't have to keep repeating functionality. Uh, you can make broad and sweeping changes quickly, and you only need to deploy once. 
which is a really great thing. You don't have to deploy all these separate little parts. You can just literally push once and your entire application's up and running. And if you want to update it, you do that. If you want a staging version, you just deploy once. It's great. So here's a look at what the typical Django application starts to look like after you start to develop it a lot. Uh, this is something that I've seen a lot. I worked at a couple different companies that use Django very heavily. And um, one of them was the worst Django site I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> And this is kind of the pattern that I see. It's really easy to do this. I don't think that it's the only thing that can happen. I think that it's very easy to make a very nice Django application. But basically what starts to happen is uh, you have all these different components that are serving different purposes and different tasks. And they start to, uh, they're very tightly coupled together, which again has all of its benefits. But it has a lot of negatives as well. So like <clears throat> your user interface will start pinging your authentication system all the time, and your supporting services will be hitting your database through the same, like it'll be interacting with the models directly. And uh, you have all this stuff that starts to happen. Your, you know, your API service will be creating scheduled tasks, which will be hitting in the API. And uh, it gets pretty hairy pretty quickly. And it's uh, not very fun. <laughs> And like, you know, you'll go to change one little part of the system and everything will break and you don't know why because everything's so tightly coupled. It's not, uh, and the abstractions aren't very clear. Um, so I think the single code bases for a lot of applications are evil, not great. Um, basically, there's like this broad tribal knowledge that starts to be acquired. Like, you, you know, there's the one guy, the senior developer in the corner, like, you know, you're sending a pull request to change something. He's like, no, you can't change that part. That's, you know, that'll break everything, you know, or that'll slow the site down. You know, like this one small component can destroy everything. Um, it, it actually makes iterative change of components difficult because uh, of, because of that tribal knowledge that's required. Um, technical debt can have a tendency to spread throughout the code base, and uh, you're forced to deploy everything at once, which can be a bad thing as well as a good thing. So... Anything is possible, but it'll often end up in a monolithic application. So this is the slide that was supposed to look pretty before. Constraints foster creativity. <laughs> Basically, uh, for me, I really find constraints to be a really good thing uh, in all the stuff I do. It's like I was talking about open source earlier and how that was a nice constraint to build things as if they're going to be open source, even if they aren't. Uh, I find this with other things as well. Uh, like text editors, I think are very nice and simple usually, and uh, versus an IDE where you have all these options and you can get lost in a sea of configuration. Um, I find the same thing with uh, the, the Linux on the desktop for me personally. Like I can tweak everything, and I will, and it's not a good thing. It's probably a, a discipline problem more than anything else. But uh, like pen and paper versus digital notes, like you can spend a lifetime trying to you know make this perfect digital note system or you can just focus on the task at hand and take notes. Uh, and I feel like this is the same for monolithic applications versus services. You can have something that solves a problem, or you can have something that starts to basically serve itself. So to think about things differently, you can try to keep all these different components of your application separate from each other instead of having them all grouped. So a very simple way to do this is uh, you think of, you have two, really two types of users for your typical application, your typical Bitcoin for dog, you know, uh, whatever, VC funded monstrosity. Uh, <laughs> you have developers and you have end users, right? Like the developers are internal or they could be external. They're going to be interacting with the application. You know, if you're Twitter, you have your API, right? Uh, and that actually does all the work. And then you have your end users interact with like this HTML interface or the mobile apps. Um, and they're interacting with a front end. And basically what you can do is you can just implement the API service once and then have the front end use the API. And that's it. And the API talks to the database. So then the front end website never has to touch the database at all, which is awesome because usually what you see in a lot of Django applications is people will start like re-implementing a lot of functionality in the API and in the user interface basically. So like you'll have a some like send an email when someone creates an account like that'll be some functionality that happens in the sign up uh, form submission process and then they'll have they'll replicate that over in the API. It's something that's very easy to avoid, but it's something that's very easy to do. And if you develop things this way, it forces you to not re-implement it more, uh, implement it more than once. So just as we built for open source and that gave us all these benefits, we can build for services. Uh, and we get most of the same benefits. Uh, components become concise and decoupled from one another. They're focused on the task that's at hand. Um, the best practices emerge 
For example, if you're building one part of your application that Django isn't or Python isn't a good fit for, you could use Go or some other language that is a better fit for that task and solve the problem better. Um, documentation and contracts become crucial. Like you cannot have an open source project that doesn't have good documentation. It won't work. And you can't have a, a web service without documentation either. So, and that's something that you're going to have to provide to your users if you're going to have an API. So you might as well just do that first and do it internally, and you can solve the same problem. Uh, kill two birds with one stone. Um, you can also scale services separately at any time. So if you have like a ton of uh, you know API requests and not a lot of front end, you can tell it that you want you know you can say I want a hundred of the front ends or something and like ten of the API or verse, vice versa instead of scaling everything up and down linearly. And it allows you to sip your own champagne or drink, eat your own dog food, which is great. On top of that, we also get composability, which is basically uh, the Unix philosophy at work. So we have these two different types of users that we talked about earlier. Um, we have developers and we have end users, and they can both talk to APIs. And if you wanted to, you know, let's say you have different APIs for both of those things. Like you could have internal users. Uh, like internal developers want to build things on an API. The end users will be hitting their own end API, and uh, those can both be powered by a single API that provides the data, the uh, data persistence layer. So then you can have an internal API, and this is what a lot of larger companies like Netflix start to do. They have an internal only API, which they wrap and like allow end users to use, and they wrap and they allow other developers to use. And they, like the internal API is like all knowing, and that's where everything happens because all these components that they build. Are, you know, there's probably like 20 or 50 different applications maintained by different teams. Uh, and you can like start to come up with really nice composable architectures like this. Like you have a single message queue and worker system that's all like powered by the backend API that you don't have to replicate for all these other systems. But they can if you want. You know, it's a very uh, composable system and it works out really well. Uh, and then you know, if you want to switch one day from like Postgres to uh, Mongo for some reason, like you know, you can just change it once in that API service layer, and you don't have to do it again, which is really great, and it gives you a lot of power and flexibility. So, uh, who here thinks this is a great idea for our dog Bitcoin tool? <laughs> Only two people. I'm not doing a very good job. Come on, it sounds awesome. We're gonna make everything distributed, and it's gonna be great. We're not gonna have to worry about scaling and all this stuff. What are the requirements? What are the requir well, that's to, that's for the VCs to decide. Yeah, it's a pretty bad example. Okay, we can switch. No, 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 mine. Yours is much better. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, let's build our arbitrary application that could be anything. And uh, we're going to use Django because Django is awesome and we use it for everything. Uh, because it's just a library, right? It just sits there. It's this simple little tool that we can use. Uh, so we're going to build like this real simple architecture that we talked about earlier. You know, you have an API service and a front-end client, basically. Uh, the front-end will be responsible for the user interface, the, the persistence and the state uh, for the users, and like the public face of the application. And the API will be in charge of the data, the business logic, and the authentication. Pretty simple, straightforward. So uh, we got to use Django to build this thing. And uh, we're going to be building an API only for Django, right? We're going to be implementing the API side, not the user-facing side. Um, you'll find a couple things start to happen. And basically what happens to me is that you have all this simpler boiler, like really uh, significant amount of boilerplate code that's required to just do simple views for, for your API. Um, and you're like, you, know, you don't have any need for template tags uh, at all anymore if you're building only an API. Um, which is a big part of what Django does. You have uh, API libraries, which allow you to make this easier, but uh, most of them are kind of buggy and they could use some love. These are getting better all the time, but uh, at the moment they're not the best. Uh, and you know, if you want to do like advanced like RESTful method dispatch, you have to like do these like if request.method equals post lines and everything. And I, I think that's better now with um, call-based views, but the experience still is like not first class. It's kind of secondary to the main Django experience. If you look at the other side for using Django on the client side, um, you're, you have to remember that the database will be totally handled by the API. So the, the front end won't be using the, the Django ORM in any way. And you'll find that basically everything in Django is tied to the ORM. Uh, basically, Django is a giant ORM. 
And um, all the third-party Django apps that you could use for the front end also directly tie to the ORM, so you won't be able to use most of those. And uh, the user model requires sessions and isn't very flexible. So like most of the benefits of Django kind of fade away when you're not d inter direct, directly interacting with the database. So when you take away the ORM, uh, what's left? You basically have this really crappy templating system <laughs> and crappy regular expression routing. And that's what Django is left with. And it sucks. So enter Flask. What is Flask? Flask is basically uh, it's a web framework based on Workzook. It's excellent for building web services. And it is basically the opposite of this. It's a great templating system and a great routing system. And it does nothing else, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, it's very elegant and simple. Here's a very, this is a full uh, WSGI slash Flask application. Uh, you just import Flask. You, give, you create an application. And then you, uh, you have a function that returns a string. And that's your route that you put in a decorator. And that's it. The whole thing runs. And it has a little debug server and everything. It's awesome. Um, it's very similar to Django in a couple different ways. Uh, it's a WSGI application framework. So just like Django is. And it has a built-in templating system. It has one called Jinja2, which many people consider to be a uh, far superior templating system to most. Uh, it'll actually, like, if I, I don't remember exactly how it works. I think it actually generates Python code from your templates, like, with the AST, and then can makes yeah. Python bycode from it. Not AST, it generates text. Oh, it actually does the entire module, yeah. and then, yeah. yeah. And then it actually, like, caches that. And it, so it's very efficient. Uh, and I think, I believe Django every time, I know there's a way to cache it, but by default, it will just, it'll, run, it'll parse it every time you load a view, I think. Um, and just like Django, it has an active community, and there's extensions for a lot of the things that you'd want to do. Uh, it's also a little different as well. Um, instead of Django, where you kind of have this monolithic, uh, or I should say this uh, uh, monotonic app object that you know, is, is there, uh, in Flask, you can have explicit and passable op app objects that you can pass around. You could have like 10 Flask apps all in a module if you wanted to. Um, it has a really simple and elegant API. There's no boilerplate at all, really, to do most functionality. Um, it's BYOB, which is bring your own batteries. So instead of Django, that, you know, it has a lot of functionality built into it, um, a ton, with all of its uh, like trib modules and all these different utilities that it comes with. Flask basically doesn't come with anything, including an ORM. Like You have to bring your own. Most people use uh, SQL Alchemy um, if you're going to use that. But you know, again, if you don't need a norm, like there's, it's not necessary to have one in, in the library, in the uh, framework itself. So it's really uh, liberating to not have a norm built in, basically. Uh, and it wouldn't even have a template system. But uh, Armin wanted to make it really simple for if you're building extensions for Flask. Basically, he wants them all. He doesn't want every extension to have its own template system. So that's why he included Jinja. Uh, but if you want to replace Jinja with Genshi or something else, then you can do that. It's like three lines of code, and it's really easy. Uh, it also uses context locals for like the request object. You'll import it from the, from the module. So you do like from Flask import request, and then that's available uh, if it's within an app context. So it's a little confusing compared to Django, where you just pass it in. But uh, he did that again, so it's easier to build um, extensions, basically. because it can get pretty complicated when you have to pass things around all the time. Um, so there's some improvements. I feel like if you have fewer batteries, uh, it makes the framework as a whole much more flexible. It can fit a lot more use cases. Uh, and it makes it less opinionated in a way. Uh, Jinja 2 is an incredible templating system. Uh, everything actually harnesses real references in Python. So like, you know, if you want to import some functionality, you can just import it. You don't have, like in, in Django, you have this. Uh, you know, installed application strings you have to put in. And like, it's kind of unclear how that actually works. And if you're trying to do some advanced stuff, it can get in the way very quickly. And in, you know, in Flask, it's like literally just Python, because like Python has solved these problems already. Um, configuration is a simple dictionary. This is the biggest one for me that I really like. Uh, you know, in Django, you have this settings module that is like lazily evaluated. And it's kind of crazy how it works. And I think no one understands how it actually works. Um, but in Django, it's like, or in Flask, it's actually a dictionary. So you can do it whatever you want to it that you're used to, um, which is great. And because it has almost no functionality built in, there's like no settings that are default. I think debug is the only one that is provided uh, by default. So like you don't even have to use the configuration if you don't want to. Um, so yeah. 
Um, one of the biggest pitfalls that people put against Flask is that it's, uh, it makes it very hard to build large applications. Um, basically, if you're going to be building these large componentized things like you have the sub apps in Django, uh, you have to kind of come up with your own way to do that in Flask because it doesn't solve that problem for you. Um, so I used to say that that was a, uh, a good thing because like, I like to solve that problem myself because then I can solve it exactly the way I want to. But now I'm more of the along the thought process of it being a good thing because, um, because it, you know, I don't want to build monolithic applications, basically. So it kind of gives you that nice constraint to stay small, to st build small, sharp, distributed services, and not build things that are too big for what they are. And it, making it difficult to build large applications is great because it'll, it'll force you to actually like, consider if that's a good idea. You're going to have to put a little bit of extra work into doing it. And it, uh, I think that's a great thing. Uh, so yeah. Um, it also has the WorkZug debugger, which is awesome. A lot of Django people like to use this for Django as well. Basically, if you have an exception and you have debug turned on, it'll give you like this HTML page with uh, an interactive and Python interpreter at exactly the part where, where it broke. So you can inspect, and uh, it makes it a lot easier than trying to like, replicate all your problems. Um, there's no import time side effects. Uh, it has a signal system outside of the ORM. And this is my favorite thing that you can do. It, it, if you return a tuple, instead of, so usually you can return a string, and that's just like the response body. It's really simple. You can also do a, build your own uh, response object. But if you want to be lazy and like you just want to do a custom status with a response, you can just give it a tuple with a content and status code, and then it'll just do that. So it's very nice and simple and handy. Um, so if you're going to use Flask and you like it, then there's a couple different extensions that are pretty popular that you might want to look at. These are the ones that kind of basically everybody uses. You have um, Flask SQL Alchemy, which makes SQL Alchemy really easy to use. Uh, kind of put, bakes it in with the configuration system and everything. So you just have like a, a database URL style configuration and it works really well. Uh, Flask Script, which gives you manage.py in Flask, which is great because everyone loves their management commands. Uh, I, this is another big part of Flask that's missing is form validation. That's not included at all, which is a huge part of what Django does. So uh, a lot of people use Flask WTF for that. Uh, and yeah, what? <laughs> I think it's, I don't know what it actually stands for. It's something something forms. <laughs> uh, and here are two, three libraries that I wrote uh, for the shameless plug. Oops. Uh, I have Flask SSLify. There's also a Django version of this written by my friend. Uh, basically, it'll, do, um, it, it'll force your app to redirect to the SSL version, and it'll do the proper uh, HSTS headers, which is awesome. Uh, Glass Google Fed, which gives you the Google Federated like, Google Apps authentication for OpenID. So if you, wanna, like, if you work for a company that uses Google Apps and you want to make it so only internal people can see this app, you just, like, it's like two lines of code, and it'll enforce that. And uh, yeah. So Flask is a sharp tool for building sharp services, and it's really important to use the right tool for the job. Uh, so if you find yourself torn between Flask and Django, between alcohol and ponies, <laughs> just remember you can always have both. <laughs> services are agnostic, and if you build things this way, you just need to speak HTTP. And if you don't want to speak HTTP, you can speak something else. Let's just keep it consistent across all the services, and you can use whatever you want. And that's it. Anybody have any questions?